Hi, everybody, and welcome to this amazing panel, I think, on student health. Uh, the title is How Can Schools Build Well-Rounded, Well-Grounded, and Well-Educated Students? Um, mentally, emotionally, and physically healthy children are essential to building a better society. What role should schools play in reaching this goal? Uh, my name is Bryony Glasgow, and I'm a local parent, and a, I, I also teach emotional intelligence and social skills to children and adults. Um, and we've got an extraordinary panel here today. We're going to just start by um, everybody having sort of 10 minutes to discuss their area, and I'll introduce them. And then we'll get a chance to have a bit of a discussion, a bit similar to the plenary you just saw, a nice smaller scale. So hopefully we should have a bit more of an interactive discussion when we open it up to questions and answers. Um, is that about right? Sounds good. That sounds good. And hopefully we won't be as angry as you. No, as content. Anybody here who works for the ministry? Anybody have any money? <laughs> just let you guys settle. <laughs> Hopefully we're going to come up with some fantastic ideas. So at the end here we have Bruce Kidd. He's a professor, an author, an Olympic athlete, an officer of the Order of Canada. He's the warden of Hart House and a professor of the Faculty of Kinesiology and Physical Education at the U of Toronto. He's a former dean of the faculty. Bruce has worked with numerous local, national, and international bodies to advance opportunities for physical education and sport. He currently chairs the Commonwealth Advisory Body on Sport, the Maple Leaf Sport and Entertainment Team Up Foundation, and the Selection Committee for Canada's Sports Hall of Fame, and is a member of the Scholarship Committee of the Olympic Study Centre, International Olympic Committee. A lot of work to do. <laughs> he also teaches and has written extensively about the history and political political economy of Canadian and international sport and physical activity. He's authored or edited eleven books and hundreds of articles, papers, lectures, as well as film, theater, and radio scripts. Bill has been involved. Bruce, sorry, has been involved in the Olympic movement throughout his life. He's participated in the games as an athlete, track and field, 1964. That's really exciting. A journalist, as a contributor to the arts and cultural programs, and as an accredited social scientist. He was founding chair of the Olympic Academy of Canada and lectures in the International Olympic Academy. He's an honorary member of the Canadian Olympic Committee. I think that's his <laughs> This is Margaret Good. She's a healthy schools and community consultant at the Ontario Physical Health and Education Association, better known as OFIA. She shares her expertise and passion with Ontario schools and their community partners as they work together to encourage and support healthy, active living for children and youth. She's a teacher and health and physical education specialist and has been involved in the development and implementation of numerous OFIA resources and initiatives, including living schools, Play Sport, Go Girls, and Health and Physical Education Supports. She was also a community facilitator for OFIA's Active Living Community Action Project and a consultant for the Physical Activity Resource Center. She is also a parent of two grown children. Yay. This is Dale Callender. He's a youth counselor working for Delisle Youth Services and has been at their school-based outreach services at Northern's Northern Secondary School in Toronto for the last 15 years. Dale has been involved in social services for over 20 years. He spent nine years at the Ashland Discoveries Child and Family Centre counselling in their residential group home and day treatment school programs and as a residential counsellor at Covenant House Toronto. He's been involved in overnight and day camps for over 15 years and has been the director of Bolton Camp, Swallowdale Camp and the director of outdoor education and camping at the YMCA Cedar Glen. He's an author and has appeared with TV Ontario as an on-air counseling support for segments on bullying and fitting in. His work with high school youth has been commended for his focus on empowering families and youth to navigate successfully through a myriad of complex challenges. His commitment through the years has been on reducing stigma of engaging counseling supports for youth, on mental health awareness campaigns, and for developing alternatives to school suspension programs. That's pretty amazing. And Kathy Dandy is the Director of Parent and Youth Engagement at Kinark's Child and Family Services. She has been a passionate advocate for Parent and Youth Voice for over 15 years. 
Kathy served for six years as the spokesperson and coordinator for the Toronto Cat Parent Network after gaining much advocacy experience with people for education. In addition to building a plan for parent and youth engagement at Kinark, Kathy was elected as trustee for the Toronto Danforth riding to the Toronto District School Board in November 2006. Kathy is a strong believer in building systems that support children, youth, and families. Her experience as an advocate has shown her what can really happen when children, youth, and families have a voice. Kathy is also the mother of a son and two daughters, and they remind her daily of the diversity and strengths and opportunities our children and youth bring us. Thank you very much. That's very impressive. So we've been given some questions to think about. I, um, I think they were given the questions to think about, but they're really timely questions that I thought might be useful just to hear at this point. Um, Share your views on what role schools should play in building healthy children. Because I think these are things we should all be thinking about, actually. Um, is it even reasonable or practical for society to set building healthy children as a goal? Who has a role to play? Is it parents, schools, governments? What policies are currently in place to encourage student health? And are these policies being translated into action at the school level? Also, what is happening in other jurisdictions? Um, Thank you very much. Uh, I'm PowerPoint dependent, so I'm going to go here. Absolutely. And I hope I don't blind my colleagues by doing this. I don't think I want to uh, do the updates right now. So, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. I'm sorry I've just popped in and I haven't uh, participated in the conference so far, uh, but I hope that uh, this presentation will pick up some of the themes that I've heard so far. So today I, I want to make two uh, overarching arguments. One, uh, that there's tremendous, massive, significant uh, evidence for physical activity and healthy eating as contributes to healthy growth uh, and development and effective learning. And, uh, I know I'll be preaching to the choir here, so I will go through that argument very quickly, but we should all have the confidence that uh, the interventions that we are proposing and, uh, act, and, and engaging in are well supported uh, by the growing research. And secondly, uh, because of the focus on public education, I want to argue that we should put our focus upon strengthening, advancing three effective but neglected avenues, the, uh, the HPE curriculum, uh, the opportunities available in after school sports, and thirdly, active school transport. Uh, and, uh, I draw the evidence from uh, two communities that I'm uh, deeply engaged in, uh, the Commonwealth and the United Nations, where uh, I've had the opportunity to coordinate uh, mega reviews of the literature for uh, decision makers. Uh, I, I can tell you that uh, uh, the, the very quick summaries I'm going to present uh, are based on surveys from all over the world and there's growing and significant saturation in findings. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the, the evidence from the global north, uh, or the first world, uh, is increasingly uh, shown to be similar uh, or, or reflective of the global south, despite the tremendous diversity of our world uh, and, uh, and, and vice versa. You can look at it from the point of view of the negatives, uh, and the negatives are huge. Uh, the, uh, the, the growth of non-communicable diseases in both uh, advanced countries and the global south is, is growing in, in frighteningly uh, significant ways. And one of the uh, major risk factors uh, is the lack of physical activity, uh, tobacco use, unhealthy diet, and two other diseases. Uh, in Canada, as I'm sure you all know, 
uh, the, um, the, the, the current state of play is, is frightening. Uh, only 7% of Canadian children receive the recommended 16 minutes of physical activity daily, as reported by Active Healthy Kids Canada in its 2012 uh, report card. Uh, and uh, we need to put uh, a class, and I would also say a, a gender and, uh, and, and a national cultural uh, lens on that, but in class terms, upper class children are three times more likely to participate than those from lower class households, so that the distribution of uh, the harmful consequence uh, is, uh, is class-based. Uh, one uh, further reason for strengthening the public school uh, as uh, a strategy of uh, enhancing opportunities and enhancing growth and, and development. Uh, the public school uh, still being the most accessible uh, institution uh, in, in the country. Um, on the positive side, uh, the, the list of studies that show significant benefits to uh, regular physical activity, particularly linked with, with healthy uh, eating, uh, is significant, and uh, whether it's from a biophysical point of view, uh, which, uh, which argues for the uh, direct correlation between physical activity and the, uh, the later onset of, uh, of non-communicable diseases or, or, or decline, uh, the evidence is overwhelming. And the same is true about the social benefits uh, and with respect to education, uh, there is clear evidence that uh, engagement in uh, school-based physical education and health programs or after-school sports programs increases retention, academic achievement, and school safety. Not all the determinations of those relationships are known, uh, but the, the, the evidence is quite clear. Uh, kids who are engaged uh, do better uh, in school and, uh, and stay longer, right across uh, the demographics. So, how can publication, how can public e education help? I wanted to very briefly headline three uh, ongoing campaigns that I hope that, that you in your various roles uh, will uh, further. Uh, the first is the campaign to get the Ontario government to implement uh, the, uh, the, the excellent, much more holistic uh, 2010 uh, curriculum. I'm sure Margaret will talk about that uh, as, as well. Uh, it's been held up uh, because of, quote, controversy over a very small section of uh, the curriculum that deals with uh, our embedded sexuality. Uh, the curriculum that uh, is so controversial is conservative, as I understand it, by comparison to what is already taught in every other province uh, in Canada, and yet uh, it's being uh, held up. OFIA has uh, a wonderful strategy of, 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 um, of rolling this out engaging school boards and teachers to be able to deliver it effectively and, uh, and it's still stalled. Uh, we need a green light from uh, the province. Uh, alarmingly, the Ministry of Health wants this to happen. The Ministry of Education uh, is dragging its feet. Uh, it's, it's something we need to uh, insist upon uh, and get this right as soon as possible. This curriculum this curriculum and all the areas I've, I've listed here is much more advanced than the curriculum now being taught, and, and these are uh, these are, are issues that our our children and youth are dealing with today. Secondly, um, we've got to insist that all parties uh, involved in the schools. Uh, maybe after the temperature goes down. Uh, create, you know, create uh, a series of agreements to protect co-curricular sports. I'm sorry I came in at the end of the panel 
and was only uh, and, and had to come up here to load my slides. But uh, uh, as you all know, uh, co-curricular sports, along with co-curricular drama and, and, and many other programs, are are vital to maintaining and strengthening healthy schools, and they're particularly vital for the health healthy growth and development of our of our children. And youth. Uh, there are so many horror stories now and disappointments where very good programs uh, have been killed uh, uh, despite the, it's up to the individual teacher that we need individual teachers being, I would say, bullied or heavily pressured by their senior colleagues that uh, to continue to offer these, um, these wonderful programs would be a career limiting move. Uh, uh, we got to make sure that down the road this important part of what we do uh, is protected from further uh, labor, uh, labor strife around the public school. Sadly, sadly, 11, 12 years ago, there was a province-wide mediation between, uh, you know, the government, the teachers, uh, the, the uh, in the various unions uh, and other interested parties, uh, which produced a report signed off on by all the major players uh, that came to a series of compromises that promised a way forward, uh, recognizing the diversity of the Ontario system and the unique character of the Ontario system, a report that I've, uh, I've indicated uh, in the uh, illustration to the, to, to the right. And, anybody would like a copy to remind yourself of, of that agreement, I'd be happy to uh, provide it to you. Um, and, 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 and somehow uh, that, that did not, was not implemented. And 10, 12 years later, we're back where we were in, you know, a generation ago, and we're, we're wrecking it for our kids. Uh, you know, my position right now is a plague on all your houses. Uh, I'd like to see them all come to the table, and in the spirit, uh, which I heard very briefly from the panel, of, of keeping our, our our best programs whole, why while uh, labor agreements are are negotiated uh, elsewhere, this important part of our uh, of what we offer is protected, and although it's headlined with co-curricular sports, I would extend that to the drama, uh, United Nations programs, and so on, that are also run at the same time and in the same way. Some very, very thoughtful rec uh, recommendations uh, embedded in the specifics of, uh, of Ontario. And thirdly, and thirdly uh, encourage more thoughtful active school transport. Um, you know, as, 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 as an oldie uh, who's lived through uh, some amazing transformations, uh, I don't want to tell you that when I was a child I walked 20 miles to, <laughs> to school uh, and then back for lunch and then back, and it was uphill both ways, and most of the time it was in the middle of a snowstorm. But, but I can tell you that there was a different, there was a different time, uh, and, and the, the amount of inactivity now is in part uh, and unintended consequences of changing changes in our school uh, programs that affected uh, uh, active school transport. Uh, in the 1960s, it was the amalgamation of school boards uh, for the the, the well-intended reason of, of of concentrating resources in bigger schools uh, and you know, creating. Uh, centralized facilities, which were at a much better level, and so on. Uh, but uh, that led to the creation of the busing industry, and then in urban centers like Toronto in the early '80s, uh, the requirement that, 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 that students go to their neighborhood school was relaxed to allow the development of these wonderful specialized schools, uh, and children could travel all over the city. But if I, I wish there was a a, a historical chart to show you the relationship between those two decisions and uh, the broad inactive school transport. 
but from living it and seeing it, uh, I can tell you that it was. What do we know? We know that children who walk to school are, are demonstrably much more active in all kinds of ways than children who, who are not. Uh, and uh, it, it, it's interesting that we know that uh, girls who walk to school uh, are uh, as active <coughs> as boys who walk to school, but girls who take the TTC or are driven to school are, are, are even less active than boys uh, who, get, who get a ride. Uh, there's some very interesting, and that this graph, uh, which uh, I probably should have labeled uh, in, this, uh, in this slide, uh, illustrates that. There's some very, uh, very insightful uh, research and uh, an advocacy going on about how this can addre be addressed even given, without changing our, our, our current arrangements through education, through the enforcement of, uh, of parking and, and, uh, and uh, speed limits around schools, uh, through uh, improved infrastructure uh, on walking routes uh, with a, you know, a, a consultative mechanism on a school by school basis, uh, but we've got to do that as well. So those would be my three recommendations to follow up in your question, what can we uh, do in the school system? And I'd be happy to elaborate on these in the question period. Thank you right now for your time. Thank you. and it's currently being revised or it's been in revision for a little while but hasn't been released yet maybe a little bit like our curriculum but uh, 
essentially a healthy school looks at four components and I'm going to get into that in just a minute but we it's called different things in different communities uh, different jurisdictions I was at an international school health conference last year and in Germany they're actually calling it good healthy schools but regardless of what you call them whether it's healthy active school communities health promoting schools doesn't matter it's really a school where the whole school community works together to share the responsibility uh, for creating healthy, well-grounded, well-rounded, well-educated kids. So that's really where I'm coming from. I believe in this approach and I've seen it work well. Um, the focus on schools, it's a natural place. Obviously, that's where most of our kids are. They spend an average of six, um, half of their waking weekday hours, an average of six hours a day, five days a week for 12 to 14 years. So that's a lot of time in school. So it can truly have an impact on their health in school and schools do have a significant role and impact influence on kids health but they can't do it alone they absolutely can't um, we believe that entire school communities so students parents the staff school boards public health recreation community partners all can contribute contribute to this uh, health of our kids um, we've been working with schools at the school level but also um, um, with school boards as they work with their partners and really the most effective way is to work with partners and we've heard a lot about that today and integrative thinking and all that kind of thing and that's what this healthy schools approach is about it's just not saying well don't worry about it the teachers will teach them health and physical education mm -hmm. that would be great if that was happening effectively in every school and it may not be um, and especially now with the uh, uh, cutbacks and uh, the extracurriculars after school it's a problem um, there are a lot of uh, ministry or government um, programs and policies in place that do support student health, such as physical activity, daily physical activity. Again, not being implemented everywhere, but the requirement is that schools, um, that kids get at least 20 minutes of physical activity daily. And that's not meant to replace physical education, not at all. It's on those days that they don't have uh, vigorously active or at least moderately active physical, act physical education. So that is. Uh, PPM 138, but I'm going to focus more on the foundations for the healthy school and the healthy school recognition program, although there are certainly a lot of other uh, uh, policies and, and strategies in place. So this is in your package. We make sure that it's in everyone's package, so don't, you don't need to take it out right now, but it really is time to take action for our kids. They're living, they're working under, or learning under a curriculum that was um, developed a long time ago. And the new curriculum is excellent, it really is. They, they uh, uh, got a lot of input from parents, from the students themselves, traveling all across the province, getting input to develop this curriculum. And it's more than just gym classes. You may have some bad memories of gym, but it is a lot more than that. It addresses a comprehensive range of topics, as Bruce mentioned, uh, including mental health and human development, sexual health, safety, injury prevention. So some of the things that you were talking about that make up a healthy school can be addressed through the curriculum. In fact, it's the only curriculum that really integrates the uh, uh, learning of important living skills such as critical thinking, personal skills, and interpersonal skills. So if it is fully implemented, that would make a big difference in the health and well-being of our kids. But at this point, it's being held up. If you want to do anything about it, please go to our website, opia.net, time, uh, time to take action for Ontario's kids. Um, we have a little online petition. Anyway, <laughs> um, so this Foundations for a Healthy School looks at four foundational components. And when I asked you what a healthy school is, you touched on all four. Really. The first one is quality instruction and programs, and that's all about teaching and learning. So it's, you know, the, of course, what kids learn in class, not just in health and physical education, but in other subject areas. It's also about the professional development and learning that goes on for teachers and others in the schools. GPA is part of that. The health and physical education curriculum is an important part of it. The next piece is the environment, both physical and social. So we need to look at the physical environment in a school. And that would include active and safe routes of school, again, as Bruce was talking about, getting that active transportation going. But also it's the grounds, the building. As soon as you walk into a school, you can tell if it's a healthy school. At least I can. I get the sense of it pretty quickly, and you probably do too. Is it warm and welcoming and inviting? I know one school that transformed their foyer into um, 
uh, an art gallery of healthy schools. So it's kids and teachers with their drawings and their pictures and everything else. It just says we're a healthy school, really. And so and there's another school that has a healthy wall of fame where um, they post pictures and drawings of, of people trying new activities and just being active in general, being healthy. Or healthy eating could be part of it as well. Uh, it's also the materials, the equipment that you have that supports the uh, school, a healthy school. Supportive social environment really is all about the climate in the school, the relationships, and um, so it's that culture of respect, and uh, it can include student leadership, because we definitely need to in in involve student and encourage student leaders. Um, uh, it's the clubs, it's the after-school activities, it's the uh, bullying prevention programs, it's all kinds of things that are due, uh, that involve the relationships, the social piece. And then community partnerships, and that gets to be challenging sometimes. It does take time to create partners, partnerships in school communities. How many of you are aware of um, a healthy school team or a health action team at your school? Great, but not enough. I'd love to see every hand go up and I could walk out of here happy. Um, sometimes it's, it's about uh, creating a team or a committee that's linked to another one. I'm going to talk about the process next, actually. And the process for being for, for becoming a healthy school. It's not a linear process, but it's really all about, first of all, getting those people together that are interested and concerned. So the fact that you're here right now tells me you're concerned about the healthy health of your kids. Um, you might want to just find out if your school does have a healthy school team or if it's maybe linked to a healthy uh, and safe school team or something like that. If not, you can use this as a starting point. This is uh, up here. It's People for educational funding support from the Martin Stroke Foundation developed this little toolkit um, that just sort of starts that conversation about what's going on in our school right now that helps to create a healthy school environment. Um, so the idea is to form a team. It might be you, it might be a, a, a teacher in the school, it could be the guidance counselor that gets it going, but bring together some people and especially bring students into it and get them talking about creating a healthier school environment. And I see this happen, this process, by the way, works um, not only at the school level, but also at a board level. And for us, it's also working at a provincial level. We're in a new partnership uh, with People for Education and Health Nexus and uh, Parks and Recreation Ontario, along with OPIA. So the four of us are now supporting, in a pilot project, supporting local school communities um, at the regional level, school board level, to partner with public health and recreation and parents and students and others to get together to create healthier school environments. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that if I have time later on. But um, so this process is establish that team. And we're finding at the provincial level, it is challenging because you're bringing those different, it's sort of back to that speaker this morning, who was talking about the uh, bringing different ideas together and it's not your idea is better or mine, I, mine is better, but let's all get together and, and we're all here for the kids. So. Create that team. Then assess your environment. So you can use, again, this is one way to start to assess your environment. Just what's going on right now in your school. And schools often say, well, we're not really a healthy school. But when you start saying, what are you doing in the area of high quality instruction or programs? What are you doing in the area of physical environment, social environment, and partnerships? And then start plotting it into those four areas. It, it's pretty clear, gee, we're really doing quite well in this area. Maybe we're not doing so well in the partnerships. Maybe we could contact our local police and get them involved. Or I know one group brings the fire chief in. He's actually part of the regional planning team. And uh, they offer a, a fitness challenge with the staff and kids. Um, think about public health as a key partner for sure. Uh, and they can also help with assessing your environment. So you want to find out what your strengths are. Find out about maybe there's a parent in your group that could teach yoga classes to uh, at lunchtime for kids or something like that. So think about all the assets that everybody brings in because that's really the strength of this approach. Then there's plan and act. So once you've done your assessment, and it could be done quickly, and it could also be very extensive, but start somewhere, start small, but keep going on it. So once you've done your assessment, identify a priority area that you'd like to work on. And maybe it's physical activity, maybe it's healthy eating, maybe it's um, safety. So whatever it is that you want to focus on, start thinking about it in terms of the four components or foundational components of a healthy school. So not just what are you teaching in school, but what's going on in those other areas. Um, 
So for example, um, and also sorry, the, the fourth area is celebrate achievements. And one way you can do that is to go to the Ministry of Education's website. They have a healthy school recognition program and just identify one activity that your school would like to be involved in that will help to create a healthier school environment and they will give you a banner and some recognition. It's just one small way to increase the awareness of the need for healthy schools. Um, so let's say your topic is physical activity. Just an example of how one school community I know addressed it. They did want kids to be more active and staff to be more active and the whole families and really the whole school community. And their school schoolyard was pretty outdated and not very functional in terms of physical activity. So they created a vision of what they would like their new schoolyard to be like. They involved all the kids, teachers, parents, everybody to create that vision. And uh, then they engaged an architect who happened to be a parent in the school. Then they went out and fundraised with the, all the businesses. And they ended up with a whole new schoolyard with a fitness trail around it, a gazebo, an uh, outdoor playground, um, a little mini putt area, and um, students helped to plant the trees and gardens. And then each class was responsible for one area of the playground. So that is that comprehensive approach to one topic anyway. So there's lots that can be done. Um, am I close to my time? Yeah, but you're doing great. <laughs> <laughs> this is a topic that I could talk about for a long time. And usually I'm not the one who talks. I prefer to facilitate the discussions because I know you guys have the answers here. It's getting those strengths from the community from the school community and bringing them together. And we often kick it off with a community consultation where we invite anyone who's interested from the school community to come in and start by talking about, gee, what would your ideal school community be like? What would be happening if it was five years from now and your school community is celebrating its success as a healthy school? What would that look like? And you get kids to talk about that. You get everybody to talk about it. Maybe not all at once. Maybe it's done separately and you add on to that vision. But then you st then you assess what's going on in your school and then you decide where you want to start. And you've got to start small. I mean, there's so many things we could do. Start small and start planning and acting on that vision and, and uh, moving forward with it. Um, I, uh, I could talk about this for a long time. For example, in Hamilton, we did this at the regional level where the two school boards were already partnering with public health, but they hadn't really developed a strong partnership with the recreation department in terms of creating healthy school environments. So through the Partnership for Healthy Kids, which is the one I was telling you about with people for Education Health, Nexus Parks and Recreation Ontario and ourselves, we started with a community consultation. So I came in and facilitated the meeting, and it just happened that during this meeting where we were creating a vision and everything else, because they were, um, there was a teacher from a very high needs school sitting right beside one of the recreation programmers and she just said something like, oh, it's too bad that our kids just don't get to skate at all. They don't have the money for equipment. They you know, can't pay for the fees. Well, that was in October and by January there was a new program called um, Skate the Dream. It started as a little pilot project and I mean little just with this one community. But they reached out to partners including boys and girls clubs in the area. Um, the uh, the local um, hockey team, I can't remember the name of it, but the Hamilton professional hockey team. Hold up, Hold up. thank you. <laughs> and um, all kinds of partners, police, fire, everybody was rallying together. The principal actually got free equipment donated from other schools. Uh, another company arranged to have all the skates sharpened, and they the kids, for a very, very small amount of money, and in fact nobody was turned away, of course, were able to skate in a six-week program. Um, as a result, they're now looking at making that a, a citywide program. It won't happen all at once, but they're really important. So it just starts with those conversations. So I'm going to actually just leave it on that just to say I really believe that if we want well-rounded, well-rounded, well-educated kids, we all have to work together and look at our school community as a healthy school community and how can we get there. Yeah, what the, what the format is, you came in late, is we're just hearing from all of our speakers for 10 minutes each, and then they're going to have a discussion, and then we're going to have questions at the end. Thank you. I'm going to get, I have a PowerPoint. Another PowerPoint, you like that. And put yours out Yeah, sure. <laughs> Sure. <laughs> 
I just want to clarify for sure. sure what you said. Yes. It sounds so. Um, our school works really hard to be an eco school. Yep. And so we're really proud to be an eco school. Awesome. So do you have something similar, but there's a healthy school designation, so that our school can work against criteria? Because that's, that's that's awesome. sort of the neutral thing that parents, administration, teachers all can rally around without it being something kind of personal sometimes. Yeah, I so do you have a designation like that? Because we were talking, it kind of sounded like you did, but I wasn't sure. Yeah. Uh, let me just say, at this point, we don't have one in the province. Um, there are discussions with various tables that might happen. But if your school is interested in moving towards it, I can email me and I'll talk to you about some ways that you can sort of look at what you're doing. Another way is look at uh, PHE Canada, uh, Physical and Health Education Canada's website right now. They do have an assessment that sort of gives you a framework for what it would be like. Okay. okay. There's another, the Joint Consortium of School yeah. Health has a healthy school plan. It's an online, everything is downloadable to assess. Um, health, if you Google Joint Healthy Consortium. School Planner, you can get the Joint yeah. Consortium of School Health. But that's thank you, thank you, sure. <laughs> well, that's a Cana and Canadian consortium. For and funded through government, so technically they're the ones that are supposed to be supported. Exactly. Thank you. Uh -huh. Okay, Dale. I, I have 10 minutes to present. I could go on probably for a long time as well. Something. I said, ah, I'm not going to do the PowerPoint, but actually that will probably make sure that I get close to the 10 minutes. It's an interesting question because when I look at student health and how can student schools build well-rounded, well-grounded, and well-educated students, I'm going to give you a premise, and I'm a little bit biased because my field is mental health. My field is as a, as a counselor. And I need to take you through mental health first to get you to the idea. So I don't want to steal Kathy's thunder because I know she's going, going to be going on to mental health. But to be able to get where I want to take you, I've got to go through mental health because I think that's significant. Um, what role should schools play in building healthy children? Well, my premise is that we need to be looking at the areas that are also impeding barriers and creating stigma. And one of those major focuses, and I think it's just coming into more focus, is the mental health. You know some statistics, 18% of children and adolescents may be suffering from moderate to severe mental disorders. Less than one in five actually receive specialized treatment. And the good thing is for almost 40 years, Dalal Youth Services, which is an agency built based in the North Toronto area, uh, has addressed these concerns and enhanced those prospects of uh, working with them directly and in the schools. So we've taken the premise of, instead of the counseling being you have to go to a traditional counselor at this agency, at this place, we still do that in terms of our regular intake counseling, but we've also now taken it directly to the schools. Student health can not just be about building, I believe, but it is about fostering and enhancing the health with our students in the school. It's only one part of their, their life, and it's also helping students feel that they're worth, they have worth in the critical sort of in support of learning. Dala operates out of six high school sites, Northern Secondary, which I'm primarily based at, North Toronto Collegiate, Lawrence Park, York Memo, Vaughan Road, and just recently we went into uh, CALP, CDL Learning Centre. It is about trying to reduce those barriers, and I make it quite clear that it is about creating a normalized sort of aspect of creating a dialogue with the kids within our school. And here's a quote, he was involved in every, in every aspect of the school, every group he helped out with, everyone felt comfortable talking to him, you know, 50 people at the name that went to talk to him about a problem. See, I go about it in a different way. I'm a counselor, a trained counselor, I have from many different sort of complex challenging areas that I deal with kids about. But first of all, I'm known as Dale in the school. I'm also known as one of the junior football coaches, one of the staff advisors to the fashion show. I'm the student council staff advisor. I sit and chair and help coordinate the student mental health initiative called Wellness, Mental Health Matters at the school. But I also happen to be a counselor. The kids know me first as an access point, as a barrier, as the junior football coach. So as you can see, and junior football, Northern Secondary, we're going to our semifinal game next week, of course. Um, there is, believe it or not, 85 kids on our junior football team. Alone. We probably in the province carry probably on our junior football senior teams, we probably carry the most in football teams in the province actually. We have close to 200 kids that are involved in our football program alone. 
Well, 85 of those kids, I've already created, I've already struck down a barrier because they know me. So, and that's in grade nine. Now, I have the longevity of working with kids right through all five, four or five years of high school. So already, I've created a connection that we believe helps build sort of healthy, wet, well-educated students because we create an awareness about how to access some help. We strike a balance between focus act, uh, activities focused on behavior problems and addressing the mental health difficulties. And we know positive findings across the full rental mental health concerns show an increase. When we balance those activities, we show improvements in depression, improvements in su substance use. And I mean improvements in terms of reducing those. Increased emotional literacy and enhanced interpersonal problem solving skills and lower problematic behaviors at school and improved academic achievement. Mental health still leads to stigmatization. With the general public, even with many service providers, the notion of mental health continues to signal deviation from the norm. It's not okay to get help. Trust me, you most, you know, I work in a high school environment. Not the greatest kids, especially high school male population, not exactly the greatest thing to go see the high school counselor, to go see the high school social worker, right? I don't want to talk about my problems. I don't have any problems to begin with, right? And then we talk about mental health. We have a lot of kids within our school programs that don't know what's happening with them. But we see the, what we call the symptomatic behavior. We see them smoking up. We see them with the academic underachievement. It's trying to understand that and make a connection. And part of making the connections is also to say, hey, is it okay to talk about mental health? Is it okay to talk about our barriers? And we know that is exactly the case. A lot of the programs that we've got involved in, again, I have a benefit of being on the ground. So we have a lot of school sort of say, hey, we can't fix it here, so why don't you try here? Or we're going to send you over here. My premise is we need to work with what we have. And so it's okay, I can send Johnny or Sally over to this other school here, but now we just, and you've experienced it, we just ship the problem over there. I think that's a disservice to the young person, I think that's a disservice to you as educators, and I think that's a disservice to the parents as well. In, 19, in 2007, an address to uh, the Empire Club, Senator Michael Kirby, chair of the Mental Health Commission of Canada at the time, petitioned for a more expansive and less stigmatization view of mental health. Quote, we need a major move of mental health services from their present location in most communities into our school program. And I think we've shifted, we continue to shift. We know modifying risk for mental health problems, there are a few more important tasks in setting interventions within the school setting. I work at a school setting that I'm there for very long hours, and at the same time, so are our kids, right? It's usually, when we look at accessing barriers, it's usually one of the most significant starting points of identification of mental health difficulties that we can see and actually start putting a concept around. Kids are there six hours a day, five days a week. You do the math in terms of how long they're there, 10 months of the school year, right? We know them and sometimes we know them at the best when we see something that's going on. My role as a school, because I'm involved in so many aspects of the school, I also have that benefit because I'm trained to see that something's not right here. Something appears to be off here. I'm more intrigued as to what's creating the behavior than saying, hey, just to dismiss that. And I think the more when we look at trying to create that awareness amongst us as educators, as parents within the school settings, we address the issue about student health. How do we build? student awareness. How do we build well-grounded students? Youth are significantly more likely to access the system when services are located in the schools. Mm -hmm. I'm full-time at the school. It's one of the benefits and premise of the Lyle Youth Work in our school-based program. Full-time. So I can say, great, if we're going to have a needing some support or we need some problems, I can potentially be available for the whole time you're there. And so, you know what, I'm in on Tuesdays of next week. So wait until Tuesday. We assert that education learning becomes more severely compromised or even impossible without paying attention to the mental health component. The Lyle Youth Services. We are partnership, and I can talk about my experience with Northern Secondary School and United Way. Uh, for the first five, I've been at Northern and I've been at the Lyle Youth Services for 15 years now. For the very first few years, uh, we used to what we call chase the money. 
So we get a grant program, and every couple of years we'd have to find the grant money, right? Five years in, we had United Way uh, made us a permanent-based uh, funding support, so we're funded right now. Currently, the Delisle Northern program is 92% uh, funding from the United Way. So in essence, we don't have to keep on chasing the money. Right? There's a need for new and volume reports that increase the students' engagement with the school, helping them connect with the school. Again, I address that question, student health. How do we build that awareness, that well-groundedness, and that well-educatedness? Each of our school-based programs offer a students a wide variety of mental health services. Individual counseling, psychoeducational groups, social service health referrals, as well as consultant assessments for school administration and teachers. When I come to the table, I know the question may come up, well, how do you do that within the school service since, wait a second, there's unions, there's social workers there. I, how do you match that? Someone might not be too happy with that. I'm going to get to that. Because when I come to the table, when I come to the local school team meeting or school support team meeting, I come as a worker of Delisle Youth Services. So what's different, we don't take over the existing services, we supplement. As I come to that table, I have access to a residential group home. I have access to a direct access to a Section 23 behavior classroom. I have direct access to a consultant psychiatrist that I can get a referral and assessment within a two-week time block period. I have, a, uh, I have uh, access to community counseling, full-time for family work, and individual counseling. So which is much different than saying, wait a second, that's our job. You're not allowed to do that, right? So that's what, deviate, that's what differentiates us uh, away from that. My premise is also, I remember back in five years ago, when, uh, no, ten years ago now, the United Way said, well, what's different about you? Why should we fund... Uh, you guys, how do you experience success within your schools? And I said, one, I think a program like ours should be in every school within the province. Yeah. I think you look at success may mean I don't know it's success, right? They look for the numbers, right? I look at, hey, five years from now, if this kid has completed uh, their uh, high school credit accumulation, that's success. Well, I know their one contact with me was helpful. Maybe, maybe not. At the same time, I can see in terms of longevity as someone with a young lady with an eating disorder. I know that received treatment and on the ground sort of support, then over longevity in terms of six months and one year has looked at sort of increasing more confidence and self control over that. That's success to me as well. Our collaboration with TDSB, Toronto District School Board, began with drop over prevention to stop kids from dropping up. Well, we know that's evolved from then. It's more than dropout prevention. It's very limited language, but it was a really catch, nice language back 15, 20 years ago. Now it is, it is about earlier intervention. It is about credit accumulation. Hey, success to me would be maybe Northern's not the best place for you. If you can get your credits over here, and I can help you get them over there, it's not about saying, hey, you have to stay here. It's about trying to prevent someone from dropping out, yes? But it's also to say the ultimate goal is we want to get you educated, right? So you don't have to do it here. And we can help support with that. This answers the question in terms of, maybe not. <laughs> I'm going to get there. Last 15 years are involved in much more drop of prevention, targeted therapeutic, therapeutic groups, activities such as wellness, if you notice, well, NSS, Northern Secondary School, oh, yeah. Mental Health Matters, and the Jack Project collaboration focused on mental health awareness and supports. Before we even partnered with our creating our own group, uh, Mental Health Awareness, uh, Wellness, and the Jack Project, uh, which is more on emerging psychiatric, uh, more mental health with the emerging sort of young adults in terms of addressing mental health, Northern was in my involvement with the Youth Services really saying, let's talk about mental health and let's talk about reducing that stigma. We did a lot of activities um, that kind of, in the back door way, kind of got us in there. For instance, stress release. We, so we had a competition in the front hall about uh, telephone ripping up. So not only was it a great activity, but we actually saw how many kids could rip up a telephone book at lunchtime for a certain amount of time, stress release, but also engage the kids. We had a substance use, knowing substance use and the connection to mental health. So we did brain panadas, and we hung them in the front hall of a foyer, and we took, and we had actually people, we developed a, a crack pipe and a joint, and kids actually hit the panadas, which is the brain, we had brains on them, right, and hit them there. Great way, kids love the candy, but also it was a great way, segue into, again, creating about awareness about student health, 
and educating about how do we get help for ourselves. Okay, neat, eh? We help develop coping skills that are transferable and contribute to successful in various settings, community, homes, and work. They serve, these skills serve as protective factors for various mental health problems. Every new school is a unique culture. What I do at Northern Secondary School, not necessarily they can do at Vaughan Road Academy or York, uh, York Memo. It is about learning about the school culture and what works there. Groups, for whatever reason, don't very well work with the kids that I work with or are involved with at Northern Secondary. But most of our other school programs, they're, they do a lot of the bulk of their work there. I'm all of a sudden. We spend time trying to establish that credibility in the specific schools. We coach sports teams, we join projects, and it's consistent with other school-based programs, our success in school is contingent on the ability to become an integrated and established part of the school that we're partnered with. Multi-faceted agency, as you can tell, again, what I bring to the table as a, as a member of the Delilah Lee Services, these sort of services. We collaborate, and this is the key, I'm going to ask, answer that question now. All of our school-based programs with July Leisure Services, we have a signed partnership agreement with the TDSB under supplemental services. So that says, okay, what are you going to do is provide an agency and you're going to do this. So is there overlap? Yes. But we're not taking away jobs from the brothers and the sisters. You know? We're not saying, hey, wait, wait a second here, we should be doing that. And that's how we do it, because we know it is about acts, and I think someone other said, there's a lot, everyone, it's about the kids. Right? I don't. I have an essence, and I say this, and I don't want to take too many people off. But I don't play the playground politics. To me, it doesn't matter if you're a union or you're. I'm there. The kid shows up on the door. My first thought is, hey, how can it is about your health? So if I can access a guidance counselor for you, I'm going to help with that. Right? I'm not going to send you away. And I think that's the premise. This is a picture. See my little office on the left there. Uh, it is about the premise of, and this is a high school environment, Northern Secondary School has 1,900 plus students. It's one of the largest schools in the province. I feel very busy sometimes. Um, the premise of this, when I first started here, my little office there, there was actually two of us in that little office, right? But also what we created is, when I shut the door, it's not about just shutting the door in terms of creating that uh, access point. It is about creating an outdoor sort of walk-out cafe area that anyone can at any time can come and get information about housing services, information about how do I deal with stress, information about accessing substance use sort of uh, institutions. So even when the doors shut, parents are there at night school, or educators come in, it is about creating that awareness, and that's what we've done here by this is the outside of the office area. Easy access, full-time access, Little overturn in terms of staffing, workers seen a uh, fabric of the school, and we provide confidential support. We're involved in all of these things in terms of our design activities. And this is the one last thing that we've done here. This is what I have done in terms of when we look at the mental health matters. So instead of just talking our specific activities, we have created a space within the school that at any time can be accessed by kids, parents, educators, about creating that awareness about mental health. There's a lot of stories. Toronto Star did a great subway of stories over the last year. So we've laminated those, and those are always up there. And for me, it's always great to see, when I'm going in and out of my office, someone just stopped in front of there and reading those stories. To me, that answers your question about student health, about creating awareness and education. And that's, for me, that's what it's all about. So that's what I have. Right. I'll be more than ready. Okay, I hope my panelists won't mind, but I'm going to turn my back to them. I hate sitting and talking, and I, and I apologize to the camera. I'll try and stand still, but I like to stand. And if any of you want to stand, feel free to stand. I also like to stand because it makes me look active, so when I put on my glasses and I look over the top, I don't look 600 years old. Because <laughs> at least I'm still moving around. So. Um, I'm going to take us out and we're going to go flying a little bit higher and then I'll come back down to school level again. Um, I have, I'm going to hand this out, anyone who didn't get it, um, it's a, you don't have to look at it now, but I, do, I am going to be briefly referring to it. 
It is um, just a list of uh, pieces of information about, um, there's some facts on it, there's some websites on it, and then just a little bit about what I'm going to talk about at the beginning, and then I'm going to get down on the ground. So mental health has been an issue for forever, but it's been an issue that's been in the shadows. And Dale referred to Michael Kirby, uh, Senator Michael Kirby. He chaired a commission to look at mental health across Canada. We're the only country in the G8 that does not have a mental health national mental health strategy. The government then formed the Canadian Mental Health Commission, and they've been working on a number of initiatives, including that strategy. And the website is on there. You can go see what they're doing. They, um, and there's also been a lot of other work going on. The provincial government, the Liberals, have done a, quite a remarkable job of starting to plow some money into the issue of child, child youth, mental health in general, and child youth mental health specifically, and with good reason. One in five, so 18%, that means in a school of 500 kids, 100 of those kids have a diagnosable mental illness. That's anxiety, that's depression, it could be something, a mood disorder, could be bipolar, schizophrenia, those are the, obviously the more severe mental illnesses. Um, they, and our, our kids, suicide is the leading cause of non-accidental death in young people, in 12 to 24 year olds. My daughter, and I'm sure if any of you have kids in high school, your kids know kids who have experienced suicide ideation, or they know a kid who's killed themselves. That is the reality of what our kids are living with. And to go to that comment about the stress in schools, our kids are under stress, and it's extremely unhealthy stress, and they're living it every day. So I'm going to talk a bit about some of the things that are going on in the province, and then I'm going to talk about what you can do. Uh, Children's Mental Health Ontario is an umbrella organization that work, that is the uh, association for agencies, publicly funded agencies in the province. There's interesting uh, resources on that website. There's a parents group, Parents for Children's Mental Health, They're like the P3 of, uh, of mental health, and they have lots of good stuff going on. You should check out their website. Mental health is addressed in the curriculum, in the physical and uh, uh, health education, education curriculum. Um, it's, I think there's a, a more of it coming, and, and we need more of it. But um, it's really not addressed in a significant way and in an ongoing way. Schools might pick up supplemental programs to do this. There's a fabulous program out in BC. The BC government put it in place. It's called Friends for Life. It's a, it's an aware, it's kind of a, a prevention program to help kids deal with issues around anxiety and depression that are not clinically based. They're just general stressors, general anxieties, how to process it. Lots of schools are looking at mindfulness-based stress reduction programs, a more meditative approach to help kids process stress, to deal with anxiety. So there's a lot of really good work going on. Um, a lot more awareness about the issue. Uh, people typically never even thought kids experienced mental illness, and now there's a growing awareness that they do. But there's still a huge amount of shame and stigma. The bullying issue, I for one, I struggle with that issue. Because although it is a huge issue, it is directly linked to mental health and mental illness. And we have to expand the conversation. So we're talking about the fact that every kid, most kids are on that spectrum somewhere. And we need to be figuring out how we deal with the external, what are called the externalizing behaviors. We need to figure out how we deal with those issues. But we also have to figure out what are the root causes. At the agency I work at, um, so I juggle a full-time job and I also am a trustee, and I work in the mental health field. And at the agency I work at, the guy that used to be our clinical psychologist has spoken, speaks often to sort of decrease stigma, create awareness, and he talks about behavior being the language of children. And unless we learn what that language is, it's, and, 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 and as a mother, I'm not good with the language sometimes. I'm not good with the F-U mom. But, you know, it's, and then sometimes I don't handle it well. I have to confess, I'm a little surprised. But sometimes, I have to handle it well, because I have to think, well, in a very extremely inappropriate way, what is that child trying to say to me? And that's where we, that's the direction we have to go to in our schools. What is it about this teacher? What is it about this environment? What, it is, it, what is it about this community that could potentially be causing that language to come out? What is it about the internal world of that child that's causing this language to come out? So, those are all the pieces that people are beginning to significantly work on. There was a partnership established between the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of Children and Services called the Student Support Leadership Initiative. It was a three-year program, got rolled into another three years, partnering with health. 
to look at the issue of mental health in schools and to get schools and community-based agencies to begin to work more collaboratively. Let's break down, you know, the break down the studies. So that actually, in each area, each area had a student support leadership initiative. Your board has one, and that had, and they were, they just decided what area they were going to tackle. And boards worked really hard on this. So did community-based agencies, and some really good work has gone on. The Center of Excellence for Child and Youth Mental Health in Ottawa became the kind of knowledge transfer point, and they gathered up all the work that's been going on and tried to share it. That was sort of the foundation that then, when the province came up with their mental health strategy, and, and you can see that, Open Minds, Health, Health Not Healthy Minds, um, that has really kind of built on that, some of that work. And the government put in, in 2011 in their budget, put out in over three years, $260 million. This past year, 400 agency-based uh, mental health workers were deployed into schools. Right now, the mental health nurses, they should have been deployed. They, it's just sometimes a really long process for everyone to work together. But I have to say, as a former activist, I have never seen these three ministries work as well together as I have. At the spec ed level and across the uh, uh, and, and equivalents into health and uh, mental health, it has there's lots of things. It is remarkable what they have done to break down the silos. And that, if any of you know me, is saying something for me to say that. <laughs> um, so 90 of the 144 nurses, mental health nurses that are to be hired have been hired and are being deployed. There's also a project called School Mental Health, health Assist. It started last year. 15 boards were part of this project. Another 15 were added this year. Those 30 boards are working, again, really hard to look at issues around teacher literacy around mental health looking at what kind of evidence-based, that's the word in mental health, evidence-based programs should be in schools. There's lots of good programs, but if there's no evidence, I hope you're gathering data on your program. If you're, because <laughs> that's why we do stuff. We know it works and we don't gather data, and then it goes, ah, oh, we don't need that anymore. But evidence-based programming going into schools, so, and, and right now, because it's been kind of, kind of in vogue to do the mental health thing, Lots of school boards are being hit up with expensive programs, not necessarily evidence-based. So ASSIST is looking for those that evidence and supporting school boards and being able to select that. Um, and then there's a little summary through those pages around what Mental Health ASSIST is doing. Um, I want to get to the, sort of you guys. Um, when we're talking about obstacles around the continued work, the real obstacle around this, there's two obstacles. One is the continued difficulties around how we, how, how people work across silos, how different jurisdictions, mental health, 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 how they work together effectively because it's one child. It's not three children with three different programs. It's one child. Um, the, I think one of the things that we have to look, there's lots of good work going on now. There's even better work going on in other jurisdictions. We can look outside this. We should have policies in every board around mental health, and they should be tied directly to our health policies. We should have uh, more integrated, coordinated services, other boards, other, other jurisdictions in the States, uh, Great Britain, Australia is doing amazing work around a more integrated approach to health, mental health, and um, education. Um, but. We have a long way to go, and I think that you here have a lot to say about this. First of all, in terms of the kinds of actions you guys can take, every school has a school improvement plan. It should be absolutely required that there is a mental health component in your, in your school improvement plan. This is essential to the well-being of every child in that school. Whether your child is struggling with a mental illness or not, they will be impacted by issues around mental well-being. They need to learn how to deal with, they need to build their own mental wellness, and, their, and that is directly linked to physical wellness. If they're doing good physical stuff, their mental well-being will be supported. If they have a, a, a healthy, mentally well environment where teachers understand what that looks like, they will be better equipped. And then for those that really have a mental illness, the stigma is reduced, they can step out and speak. There's a statistic that says 42% of parents would rather, I can't remember what the rather is, but it's something really ridiculous, would rather disclose something about their child than tell someone that their child has a mental illness. Like it's just, it's not something people even still want to talk about. And lots of parents with children with mental illness, they're the bad. 
they're the parent in the school with the bad kid. Or um, I'm going to go to that student success piece, despite the fact that I'm a trustee. Student success is not graduation. We have lots of kids who graduate that crash. Look at our universities. What are we hearing from them? Right. Has anyone thought, thought of third about Queens? Mm -hmm. It's like it's not student success is not credit accumulation. So I'm gonna th that's sort of in my next part about what what schools and governments can do. But I want to stay with you for one more. Um, this is a great survey, and I do realize it was done by the Heart and Stroke Foundation. And I, and I, no, it wasn't. Well, it was funded through the Heart and Stroke. So I realized that was kind of true, but. And I love Annie. And can you turn the camera off a minute? This needs to be revised. There's no mental health question in this survey. There's a nod to it at the, the number 20 about mental and emotional, but there's nothing in there about mental well-being. And I want you, so maybe what I could ask in the interim is that each one of you, when you go through that, and you do the whole survey, and then do it again and substitute mental health. In terms of schools and, and, and governments, so this is where we have a lot of work to do. There's great work going on, but the fact is, I sit at a lot of coalition tables, I do a lot of work with, uh, in both jurisdictions, and, it's really, and my own children keep me grounded in this. Lots is going on, but what we really need to continue to do is make it a more integrated approach. Schools should be doing project-based learning. We have to have the physical, the mental, we have to have kids doing um, relevant content in their lives in what they do. Because if we just deliver in static subject matter, if we just do, okay, phys ed over here, and oh, now we're going to tell, we need to tell them about mental health. But if we're not integrated into project-based learning, they are not really getting the relevancy of really anything we're doing. It also doesn't engage them. We need to create partnerships. All your schools should be reaching out and finding partners to work with around mental health, physical health. We need to continue to work with outside agencies. That's a huge stressor on your administration. I understand that. A huge stressor on your teachers, but it needs to become habit forming while we're building the systems that support them. They must be partnering with external agencies and organizations, such as Delisle and others. Reach out. Um, they can work with their superintendents. There's lots of ways in which they can do this. We must have schools looking to deliver curriculum outdoors more. We must, when we do our facility renos or we build, we must have eyes on natural light, sound, lots of, lot. I mean, the great thing about this, this is why I have come to absolutely love research. This is all now being captured in research. We know this stuff works. So, finally, on the government level, we must be lobbying our government to revise our curriculum. We've got one waiting in the wings in phys ed and, and, and <coughs> in health and, and, and physical health. But we must look at this ridiculously content laden uh, curriculum. I um, was at a, a summit last week, uh, the Ontario Public School Boards Association, I'm on their organizing committee for the summit, we held a mental health summit, it was fabulous, and there was me there, it was really great, I was actually really impressed with it, I didn't have anything to do with getting the content, and the content was amazing, and um, Minister Broughton spoke, and I have to confess, I always said, okay, don't get up, don't get up, don't get up, and I was right first at the mic, <laughs> so I said, I said, oh, you know, blah, blah, blah. This is, I did, I acknowledged the greatness that has gone on, a lot of really good stuff has gone on. But I said, the curriculum, we need to do this. And she had a lot of good language coming back. She gets it. No, teachers should be facilitators. We're in a content-rich society. We need to guide students. We need to engage students. We do need project-based learning. We need them to know what to do with the vast volume, the avalanche of content that's coming at them. We don't need teachers standing in front of them. We don't need them telling them what to do. We need them engaging them. That is a mentally healthy activity. So that is something the government must do. It must give over on the content. It also must look at the quality of the relationships in the classroom. I'm not supposed to talk about <laughs> KINARC or the Toronto District School Board, but the Toronto District School Board is working on a project, and I encourage you to see how you can do this in your boards. It's been informal. It's moving to a formalized project to look at the quality of the relationship in the classroom. Re research in Mental health, they talk about it as therapeutic relationship or therapeutic alliance. 
as much as 30% of the success of a treatment is directly related to the relationship. That is higher than any evidence-based practice can claim, and it's equally as true in the classroom. The quality of the relationship, the ability to work, not to like them necessarily, but to see them, to know them, to develop a relationship with them, and this is the nirvana, to co-construct education with them. So they're learning, but they're co-constructing with the teacher so that, they're, that all the important rubrics, the literacy, the numeracy, it's all there, but it's relevant to them, to their lived lives. So that's a piece the government has to work on. And finally, and then I will shut up, integrated service delivery. I've been working on this for years, and this is hubs. We must have hubs where Delisle does not have the largesse of the United Way enable it to have a youth council or a social work in the school. Every high school should have one of those and it should be publicly funded. And we should have our agencies. Every single agency I know is renting corporate space. And yet we want to close our schools. Yeah. Yeah. Every yeah. single agency should be moving in. And, and not all services should be in schools. There are services that absolutely should not be in schools. But we should be looking at the integrated model. We should be looking at how we have health clinics in our schools, preventative, for our seniors. We should have all sorts of ways in which we look at how we break down these silos, silos truly and we really have a physically active, mentally, emotionally healthy, engaged community in those hubs. And the government is doing nothing about that yet. So, even you can, when you do your partnerships, you can be talking to your board about how that happens. It does happen in pockets, but it's happened, it's the work of heroes. It's the work of those that care passionally about physical well-being, or mental well-being, or both. They are working against all odds. We need policy and funding that dovetails into the support of this. And I think I'm going back And there's lots of great examples of that elsewhere. We don't have to read I'm totally over time. <laughs> but actually, I, I learned so much that I, I was very nervous about. Um, I hope you did too. Right, right, right. I, I'm not supposed to be taking notes, but I couldn't stop myself. Um, I, it's just something I want to point out. But I, I felt today it was very interesting, the speakers that were chosen for this panel, because there was definitely a physical education, mental health, well-being. I think we almost missed the social well-being piece. And if we could even just have one discussion question, I'd like the four of you maybe just to, to comment on those silos within the work that you do, that sometimes maybe the initiatives that are happening in physical health and physical education are not really talking to the initiatives around mental health, and yet you just said, I mean, all of you did touch on the point that they're all, they all benefit one another, they're all self, they all add to healthy schools, they all contribute to all three points of social, mental, and physical um, well-being. So how can your different agencies really address all of those issues in the work that you're doing? So that you don't just talk about the one thing, you bring in all three aspects. Yes. I, I think, um, actually, there's, again, I, I've said, I've become a fan of research. I think there's some really interesting research out there around outdoor education. There's a movement in the United States called No Child Left Indoors. <laughs> I've of these much hated other ones. And, and I think that we, there are lots of places to look where these are actually already coming together in terms of how physical and mental, social, emotional, that they are all dovetailing into it together. And I think probably all of us in, I mean, you could, as we all could talk for hours. Yeah. And, and if we talked for hours, we would cover the waterfront. I think what we have to make sure we're doing is that we're, we, we use language that is, indicates that we're doing that, and also point to the research where it is all coming together. And it is in a pretty powerful way. Mm -hmm. yeah. Two things I'd like yeah. to say. One is that this curriculum does address mental health. It's actually integrated throughout the curriculum. So yeah, again, that's much better. It would help a lot. It's, right. it's never enough in, in my way. There's so much more we need to do. As far as research goes, I'd like to just talk for a second about um, one of the initiatives we did at, uh, through OFIA, and that was called the Living School Project, which is essentially a healthy schools approach, but at the school level. And we worked with, supported, 
you will, uh, 35 school communities throughout Ontario, very, each one very different, very unique. And it, but there was a very uh, rigorous research component, evaluation component to it. And at the end of just one year, even though our researchers said we wouldn't notice any difference in behaviors, um, the evidence showed that physical activities and healthy eating behaviors among kids and teachers improved just after one year, and we did go on for three years, attendance uh, and attentiveness and alertness improved. There was redu <coughs> reduction in behavioral issues, and uh, a sense we, we surveyed the students, and there was an increase in connectedness to the school, which is certainly part of that social and mental health as well. Um, and as well, there was an improvement, overall improvement in EQAO test scores. So even though these schools put more of an emphasis on taking this healthy school approach and working with partners, there were significant improvements and overall health, not just the physical health. And when we're looking at healthy schools, it really is <coughs> all the health issues in one. So it's, it's physical activity and healthy eating often come at the top, but it's really um, looking at all areas of health. Yeah, I would make two points. One is that uh, I fully agree that the integration that uh, Margaret and Kathy have talked about is absolutely essential and the most effective program for those that, uh, that create uh, an integrated uh, approach and delivery of particular experience that children need. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that is vital. Secondly, uh, I want you to know that my uh, approach to after school sport or physical activity or, or physical education focuses on the social relationships mm -hmm. and in terms of my criticism uh, of the, the field that uh, I often speak about in sessions like this. Uh, I feel that uh, that a huge opportunity to build healthy um, interpersonal and particular intercultural uh, relations has been lost. Uh, I think uh, a team or a sports program, uh, and there's lots of evidence that this provides a wonderful opportunity to build healthy relations uh, between uh, children of different backgrounds different abilities, <coughs> different achievements uh, in, in the classroom, uh, and, and too often. Uh, well, I, I can't really be critical of particular programs because I don't have the day-to-day -day experience uh, of our schools and our, our, our programs that I used to, but generally speaking, I think the focus is on the performance, and the access to notes, and not on. And, um, in my world, this is a soapbox that I've been on for years. <laughs> uh, the, the, I'm going to join you. <laughs> the biggest failure is in, is in, internet, is in inner school programs, and then, uh, you know, inter-board programs, and at, at my level, uh, national teams, where uh, we completely fail to provide uh, a vocabulary and experience for intercultural education. Uh, you know, my version of this soapbox is that universities like mine uh, you know, fundraise and put aside funds from uh, fiscally challenged programs to give our, our best students intercultural opportunities uh, across Canada and across the world. And our sports programs uh, provide these opportunities every day, mm -hmm. and yet we don't take advantage of them, and, and we should. So I fully agree uh, with, uh, with the critique and certainly would like to see more, uh, more constructive uh, reaching out um, and, and, and certainly insist upon that because uh, they're, what they've said is absolutely dead. Uh, questions? Let's just go straight in. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so a couple things. Uh, fantastic that you guys are all here today and the presentations are really overwhelming almost. Um, I, I wanted to share something because you know the mental health uh, piece I think is you know starting now to be addressed in high schools and, and, and we're, we're starting to see that but up in Simcoe County uh, five years ago we started a pilot project at an elementary school and it was just supposed to be a you know quick pilot project you know they were in and out and it was with the children being society um, and they came in um, to work with uh, a lot of socioeconomic um, families live in that area poverty is uh, huge in certain pockets uh, for our school and we really wanted to address 
um, to provide resources and, and reaches. So instead of protective, they really took on a preventative role within our school to be that that advocate and that the, you know that voice for that for that child. Um, we still to this day have that pilot project, and now we're starting to expand that to our elementary schools. The success and the reason I want to share it is because what you, what you what you said is really you know important when you're collecting data. What we've seen is reaching those kids at the younger ages and addressing those mental health issues right. from as, as, as small as test anxiety to right. the much bigger right. issues. Right. Yeah. By the time they're getting to high school, the students that have directly come from Allendale Heights to our secondary school, our the, the high school, um, have been very, very successful and have been more engaged and involved within the school and, and all of those things. So, Ophia, I mean, we're inviting you to our conference in April um, that our, our board's holding because we think that it's not just important in the high schools that the earlier you reach those kids with those mental health issues, um, the bigger it is. But the one question that I did have was, um, in regards to the Minister of Education and how they're supporting um, these groups and pulling the, the resources within, into the schools. And are you running into barriers? Um, are they wanting to do this kind of themselves or are they more welcoming to uh, bring OFIA, for example, and, and you know, throughout throughout the boards, not just TDSB, because we do hear a lot of stuff going on in Toronto, but I'm, I'm really talking about provincial wide. Well, I can give you that. I can give you the, the quick hands-on um, uh, version of that. Um, again, we're in six different schools. Uh, well, we used to be in a different school last year, but the partnership didn't work because the people on the ground really put up the barriers, which is fascinating when you think of it, right? I get the whole concept of bringing in, I'm an advocate of that. But on the ground, sort of, educators and professionals, there's still some resistance to that to external partnerships, right? The, the legislation is there, the partnership ideas are there, but you still have people saying, no, you know what, I'm going to refer here. I'm not going to refer there, right? I'm not going to give you an office with a phone, right? I'm going to give you... So, and, and, so I hear what is there, out there, but the reality on the ground sometimes, no, there are a lot of barriers and stigmatization to that. So it is about continuing to work. I remember from my very first year there, I had a colleague working with me, and I was new to the program. The principal would call up to our office and ask to speak to the other person, not to, to me, because, again, this was someone that she knew. Um, and I give that example because we have six different programs and we're at Kelp this year when last year we were not, we were somewhere else and the partners today came back to us and said, you know what, we think it could be met in-house services. We don't think that's going to work any longer after three years being there. So I think there is still that those barriers there, but there is a lot of other great partnerships that are happening, there's no question. Yeah, you do that. Yeah, hi, I'm, I'm one. I'm Sharon Gross from the Heart and Stroke Foundation. And, um, and actually. Great survey. I want to, oh, and it's totally fine because actually we didn't create it. No, I know. Um, but, and part of it is, is my role is I'm, I'm leading a, a, a national child health and wellness strategy. And I actually do believe one of the biggest challenges. And one of the issues is we need to start redefining what health means. Yes. Yeah. And, and it is. And what student success means. Eggs, thank you. Yes. And actually, and it's, if we go back to the conversation early this morning, one of the biggest challenges, five years ago, I was at the same P Furry session because of our relationship with, with them has been for five years. There were four people in the room talking about health in the schools because it wasn't as important. It's lovely to see more people, yeah. but it still is an and or discussion. It's not yeah. an and discussion, it's an or discussion. Student success versus health. Health isn't an end point. It's a process to achieve what we want to achieve. And I think it's starting those kinds of conversations. And while I would agree that there is more evidence than we had before, I would still agree that we don't have the right evidence no, no, or the buy-in to say that these are right markers of progress. Because yes. Margaret, oh. I worked at the Ministry with Living Schools. It was a great evaluation. It wasn't recognized as good data because it wasn't the right kind of research. 
So there's all of these sorts of processes, and I think that's one of the roles as parents, and part of the conversation is to start talking about what's important and what are the outcomes we want, and what is the role of the school as a community hub. And each community is has its own makeup, and you have to respect that, but there are also principles that can be at a city level, provincial level, or even national. But that's for me why I'm after the relationship stuff. What are the core competencies that it takes? It shouldn't be just someone's good at it. Oh, that's just a good teacher and that's a crappy teacher. Mm -hmm. What are the core, because if we establish what the core, and I'm getting very tangled with, what are the core competencies? What are the benchmarks we're looking at? And then how do we measure it? Well, then we can do professional development. And then we can actually hire. We don't have to hire on a subject basis. I mean, that's part of it. But pedagogy, we've got that part down. We need to nail down. And that's foundational because then we understand what the relationship piece looks like around and then relationships up and down the chain too. And I think something that's coming up is just putting it higher up on the value, right? Mm -hmm. Protocol, it's higher up. And I thought your point at the beginning was brilliant. The fact that there wasn't a public outcry, that we were getting rid of all those extracurricular activities which all create mental, social, and physical health, right. and that the teachers could just not do it and go, oh well, there's no soccer, my kid won't get any physical exercise. It was a much bigger deep sort of deficiency. Yes. I just wanted to make one point. Um, we don't have to wait. There's a lot of great stuff going yeah. on. Yeah. Yeah. I'm on I'm on various levels of involvement, but uh, at my school council level, a group of parents have got together, all with different backgrounds, and we're starting to help them all. We don't have to wait for our yeah. board to finish their mental health strategy. Yeah. We don't have to no, wait no, for this. School wait for that. Every There's great school. material. Yeah. There's ways that we can work with our administration to start bringing more information in the school. So we can start it as parents ourselves to become better educated and share that with parents and make it okay. And by having a health and wellness committee and having it part of our council, they're endorsing that as much as they're endorsing fundraising and other activities that it's on the agenda. But lobby because it shouldn't be the work of heroes. There are too many schools that wouldn't um, we're have not you heroes. there. We just don't want to wait. Sure, yeah, but there are schools that don't have you. Yes, Cassie. Thank you. <laughs> I just wanted to, to go to take it up to a, another level and to join some dogs. And that is, um, I actually, I spoke about this this morning, but I deputed at the standing committee at the provincial level when they were looking at, I think it was, I think it was legislation, it was Bill 150 or something. And it was on the role of boards and student success. And it's when they were talking about taking over boards, in other words, going into supervision, not just for failing to balance the books and meet the bottom line, it was if they felt that academically the kids weren't achieving. And that's when I said to them, look, student success for me is when my grade 11 kid gets up and puts his backside in a classroom, right? I'm not even at the graduating part, so don't tell me, success for, and I agree with what you said totally, success for every kid is different. So please pay attention, please have your questions ready, because we're headed for an election, and I need it. You need to ask the people on the ground whether they intend to reverse that and where they stand on these things. We don't have to wait for anybody, but we do have to inform ourselves and be prepared to ask these questions, and they're tough, right? We need to figure out where we stand and make sure that they understand clearly that we're not going to stand for this as parents. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> yeah, good. Um, my question is for they are already in the field of healthy sports. Uh, I thank you very much to the for all of you. As a parent, with all of these new uh, models that are coming for the schools and uh, principals who want to break, principals who want to lock, <laughs> um, and how can we work with those dynamics as a parent in the school? Uh, when we know this is going to be a great thing for the school, but the system there is really very opening. <coughs> you are another agency, you know, you're different dynamic communication, but even us as a group to the parents, it's another dynamic there, even if we know that it can be good for all the community, and that we are 85% of our kids are close to put out of the school. So you're asking but we how? See how strategic we can. They start moving those pieces because what you face and we also face as a parent. And uh, with some experiences from all of you, how you have been breaking through, uh, you can give at least two or three pieces. And we can start it because I, a lot of these things have been based on our children. 
but we find those blogs. And it's not English, again, for us. Many of us had, and we have been educated with an English as a second language. Now we can discuss with you at the same level. Mm -hmm. But it's still dynamic of systematic racism and discrimination to say, I don't understand you. It's just yes, yes. to understand us. No that excuse is no longer for many of us parents. It's for new parents too, but we try to empower them. So don't use that excuse. I think part of what uh, I address, it, it is about, and I can just say from the terms of Dalai Research, we look at each school being the unique nature yes. in them sure. themselves, Thank right? You. So already going in, you see what the, the need is, right? And the other piece I think, uh, and, the, and my colleagues here have said, you know, it is a lot about evidence. It is about uh, a reputation. It is about credibility. It is about a trust on the ground and what you bring to the table. And I think that gets you in the door. But also, once you get in the door, it is about you know, who you're establishing the rapport with. Uh, I would, could sit in my office very lonely and working on the computer all day long if I didn't have that connection with the people that I'm supposed to be there for, which are the kids, right? So that where you spent the bulk of the work when you first established at one of the schools, close to four, five, six years establishing who you are within the, in the school, right? And I think those are the pieces that help address some of that. So, so the question is really around how do you overcome blocks in administration and when you want to bring agency or change into the school, how do you deal with a principal or an administration who's just saying, no, we can't do that? Yes, no. I'm just going to say briefly, you must work with, uh, if you really have gathered a group, you've done your best, you go to the superintendent and then you go to the trustee. You just work your way up the chain and you talk parent engagement, healthy communities, and you certainly can talk health and mental health because provincial governments are talking about it a lot and there's a mandate. I think we've got time for another question. I'm sorry we've so run over. Thank you. I just want to commend all of you for mentioning partnerships, community partnerships being so important to yeah. me in this issue. Um, I'm one of very few people here today that are from a community-based agency, and so I'm glad to see there was such a strong emphasis on that. And I want to encourage all the educators in the room to reach out to the local neighborhood centers or local community health centers because we have staff that have been trying to get into schools for years and we'd be happy to play a role in this in school. Yeah. Can I say though, this is where you must lobby. The reason, here's an obstacle. The government brought in a policy memorandum that school boards, when they bring in a partnership and they occupy this much space, they only get to count this much space and that's still counted as empty. So that's a ridiculous policy barrier that makes it difficult for schools to function and get people in. Right. Well, thank you very, very much. I'm sorry we went over. And please take, take all these materials at the front.